Hi folks, today I'll be going through a list of 12 methods to reduce the amount of child support that you have to pay. Each of these methods is 100% legal and can be done in a fully ethical way. I will say at the very outset, the point of this list is not to stop children and parents who need money from getting it. We, we certainly don't want that. The idea is to give some paying parents greater control over their finances and to give the kind of advice that they might be able to get from an accountant. I'll talk about the motives for making this video towards the end of it, but let's get stuck into the list. The number one method for reducing the amount of child support that you have to pay is to increase the amount of care that you provide. Child support gives each parent credit for care costs based on the number of nights of care they provide per year. Now they have quite an odd schedule for working this out and I'll just go through that. If you have zero care of a child, you get zero credit for care costs. You only start getting credit for care costs once you reach a threshold of two nights of care per fortnight. Now at that point you get a sudden jump and so the amount of credit you get for care costs goes from zero to 24%, which is equivalent to 3.4 nights per fortnight but that level stays fixed up until you get to five nights of care per fortnight. Then the care amount goes up to 26%, which is equivalent to 3.7 nights per fortnight. At six nights of care per fortnight, you get credit for 5.7 nights of care. And if you have a 50-50 arrangement, each parent gets equal credit for care costs. As a payer, you want to get at least two nights of care per fortnight, but preferably up to six or even seven nights of care in which case you're getting almost equal credit for care costs as the other parent. Another method to potentially reduce child support is to enter into a binding child support agreement with the other parent. This is where the two parents get together to decide the terms of the child support arrangement. The agreement could cover cash payments and how they change over time. It could also be based around each parent covering certain costs for example, one parent paying private school fees, the other parent taking care of daily costs. Whether the agreement actually reduces the amount of child support you pay depends on the outcome of the negotiation. But generally, these agreements are good for child support payers. Once the payment schedule is locked in, you're then free to try and earn as much as you can to do the best you can for yourself and for your child or children. The only way to ensure that the agreement is binding is for both parties to see a lawyer and to have a legal certificate attached to the agreement. Otherwise, child support may not recognize the arrangement that you've entered into. If an agreement's not legally binding, the recipient can go to child support and seek them to collect payments from you, and these can be backdated. So I highly recommend that you both see lawyers and make the agreement binding unless you truly trust each other to follow through. Number three on the list is don't chase pay increases and just settle for a better work-life balance. When you're a child support payer, there's a couple of reasons why going for that promotion or doing overtime or going for that more difficult but higher paying job can be bad ideas. The first is that you're giving up a lot of the extra income that you earn. Child support can be like additional income tax and often child support payers face effective marginal tax rates in excess of 50%. In other words, for each extra dollar that you earn, you get back less than half of that yourself. The rest goes to the tax man and your ex-partner. Also, when your income goes up, you may not be able to bring it back down again for child support purposes. If your income drops, the other parent is entitled to put in a change of assessment application and seek to have your income for child support purposes restored to its former level. An alternative option to give you greater control over your finances is to become self-employed. So you move from salaried work to working for yourself. If you're successful in self-employment, you've got a great deal of control over the nature of your work, how much you do and how much you earn. But there's also risk associated with being self-employed. Apart from the lack of a stable salary, child support are notorious for going after self-employed people. They could easily set your income to a much higher level than it actually is. <coughs> Number five on the list is to hire a good tax accountant 
or otherwise arrange your tax affairs to minimise taxable income. Child support is calculated using taxable income. That's your gross income, which might be salary and interest, for example, less any eligible tax deductions. But there's only so much you can do to minimise taxable income through accounting techniques. For example, if you salary sacrifice a lot of your income into super, then child support can just add that back in. A general strategy is to put your money into assets which produce long-term growth rather than current income. Some good asset classes for child support payers include your super, stocks which don't pay dividends or which only pay small dividends, and cryptocurrency. These are all assets which can produce long-term growth without necessarily producing much income in the short term. Tip number six for reducing child support is to pay only what you received credit for. The rules around what counts as child support often don't favour payers, so be careful before paying anything out of your own pocket or sending money to the other parent. Make sure it counts as child support, which may require you getting written acknowledgement by the other parent. Normally, you should just pay the exact amount of child support you are required to each month. If you have some care of the children, also pay directly for normal care expenses when you have the kids and any activities or purchases you personally choose. It should be said that there's no firm rules around what happens with child support money. Once the recipient gets the money, it's theirs to do with as they see fit. In general, the expectation is that you spend according to what your percentage of care is. So if you've got the children about half the time, really you should be covering about half the costs. If you've only got them some of the time, then you should only be covering some of the costs. If you never see the children, then you shouldn't have to pay any more for them. That's just applying the same assumption that the government uses. They assume that each parent contributes to the cost of care roughly according to their percentage of care time. If your income is actually lower than previously, you should tell child support immediately. They don't do backdating for payers as a general rule. A downward adjustment in child support is likely to be made if your income is at least 15% lower than the last recorded taxable income. On a similar note, if your income turns out to be lower than last year, then get your tax return in quickly. Always remember that child support don't do backdating for payers. They have a general bias in favour of handing out money to recipients as quickly as possible and making adjustments in their favour as quickly as possible. But for payers, the reverse applies. So if you've overpaid over some historical period, it's often quite unlikely that child support will give you credit back for those overpayments. Tip number nine is to avoid triggering a change of assessment process against you. The most common reason for a recipient pursuing a change of assessment is if the payer's income has dropped significantly and they can't really justify the drop. If child support believes you've reduced your income as a strategy to reduce child support, they'll be inclined to favour recipient in a change of assessment process. Typically, when this happens, they set your income for child support purposes to the highest amount that you've ever earned. As a general rule, you can't take a different job voluntarily if the income is lower. Also, you can't take time off work to study if it means you're losing income. Those things will likely be regarded as methods of escaping child support and therefore you're likely to be found against in a change of assessment review. Tip 10 is the opposite and that's to initiate a change of assessment. If you believe the recipient has greater income earning potential than what they're achieving, then you have the right to apply for a change of assessment on the basis of earning capacity. You can make a claim that the recipient is earning less than what they could as a way of increasing the amount of child support that they get. There are some challenges with making claims against the recipient. If the recipient is the primary carer, and the child is not of school age, then essentially the recipient is entitled to stay at home and not work if they so choose. Another problem occurs when the recipient has been out of work for a long period of time. You can make a legitimate claim that that person is not working in order to maximise their child support payments. However, because the recipient lacks an income benchmark, 
child support is unlikely to change their income. Tip 11 is to donate to charity. If you feel that your children are well looked after and you're paying more than enough child support, there's nothing wrong with giving to charity. This will do some good for the community and it will also reduce your taxable income since donations to charity are tax deductible. The final strategy, and this is quite a risky one, is to have more children. Having more children increases a parent's self-support amount in child support calculations. It has a mildly beneficial impact on your child support assessment. Of course, you're up for extra costs on raising the child or children, and if, God forbid, that you separate from the parent of that child, you could be paying extra child support in the future as well. I hope you found this presentation useful and that you'll use the information wisely. For child support payers, there's a whole system that's geared towards getting money out of them and giving it to their ex-partners. So part of the point of this video is to redress that imbalance just a little bit. Ultimately, our goal is to introduce a better child support system, one that's simpler, better for children, and fairer for parents. To help raise awareness of what we're doing, it would be fantastic if you liked the video and also subscribe to the channel.